we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the, go, you know the, you know the thing. Yeah, hell yeah! Hell yeah! Even those communists unable to secure political power, and thus lacking the ability to persecute believers, still did their best to persecute the teachings of organized religion and ridicule the idea of the existence of God. In fact, even in America, it was no surprise to stroll by a city newsstand in the mid-20th century and catch bold front-page headlines like this in the Daily Worker, the communist organ published by CPUSA, There is no God. Communists were proud of their atheism, always militant and never shy. The fact that communists devoted so much time and effort to anti-religion reflects that remarkable devotion, again, an almost religious-like devotion, to the goal of eliminating religious faith. It also attested to the communist conviction that religion truly was incomparable with Marxism-Leninism. Nothing else seemed to elicit such howls and hisses from Karl Marx's disciples. Hell on Earth The Richard Wormbrand Experience Again, so many such examples could be cited. This chapter will conclude with some frightening images from the vicious communist state that was Romania. Richard Wormbrand was a pastor who endured 14 years of hell in a Romanian prison. He detailed some of the unspeakable cruelty he witnessed in testimony before the U.S. Congress and in his widely read Tortured for Christ, first published in 1967. Thousands of believers from churches of all denominations were sent to prison at that time, remembered Wormbrand. Not only were clergymen put in jail, but also simple peasants, young boys and girls, who witnessed for their faith. The prisons were full, and in Romania, as in all communist countries, to be in prison means to be tortured. He recalled the example of one pastor. A pastor by the name of Florescu was tortured, with red-hot iron pokers and with knives. He was beaten very badly. Then, starving rats were driven into his cell through a large pipe. He could not sleep because he had to defend himself all the time. If he rested a moment, the rats would attack him. He was forced to stand for two weeks, day and night. Eventually they brought his fourteen-year-old son to the prison and began to whip the boy in front of his father, saying that they would continue to beat him until the pastor said what they wished him to say. The poor man was half mad. He bore it as long as he could. Then he cried to his son, Alexander, I must say what they want. I can't bear your beating any more. The son answered, Father, don't do me the injustice of having a traitor as a parent. Withstand. If they kill me, I will die with the words, Jesus and my fatherland. The communists, enraged, fell upon the child and beat him to death, with blood spattered over the walls of the cell. He died praising God. Our dear brother Florescu, was never the same after seeing this. Wormbrand's captors carved him in a dozen different parts of his body. They burned eighteen holes in him. What the communists have done to Christians surpasses human understanding, wrote Wormbrand. He said that communist torturers often told him, There is no God, no hereafter, no punishment for evil. We can do what we wish. Wormbrand described crucifixion at the hands of communists. Christians would be tied to crosses for four days and nights. The crosses were placed on the floor and hundreds of prisoners had to fulfill their bodily necessities over the faces and bodies of the crucified ones. Then the crosses were erected again and the communists jeered and mocked. Look at your Christ! How beautiful he is! What fragrance he brings from heaven! After being driven nearly insane with tortures, a priest was forced to consecrate human excrement and urine and give Holy Communion to Christians in this form. This happened in the Romanian prison of Pitesht. I asked the priest afterwards why he did not prefer to die rather than participate in this mockery. He answered, Don't judge me, please. I have suffered more than Christ. All the biblical descriptions of hell and the pains of Dante's Inferno are nothing in comparison with the tortures in communist prisons. This is only a very small part of what happened on one Sunday and on many other Sundays in the prison of Pitesht. Other things simply cannot be told. My heart would fail if I should tell them again and again. They are too terrible and obscene to put in writing. 
It was not an unusual Sunday at the Petest prison, a frightening house of horrors that even the imaginative Dante Alighieri could not have conceived. The Hell That Was Petest What Wormbrand described from the prison of Petest is just a small, bitter taste of an awful place filled with tales of depravity. Those that prowled about that political penitentiary and brainwashing re-education center in the city of Petest, located on the Argus River in Romania, beginning in 1949 and continuing among several years and perhaps thousands of inmates, have been acknowledged in the communist world and noted by the likes of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, but have not received the attention they should. In the West, a website with English translation has been created and devoted to the subject, appropriately titled The Genocide of the Souls, The Petest Experiment, the website, an extension of an accompanying film project, is maintained by Romanian filmmakers Soren Iliesiu and Doru Lucian Iliesiu, partnering with the renowned French scholar Stephanie Coutoua, editor of the Harvard University Press classic The Black Book of Communism. The site captures some of the truly ghastly testimonies that have been preserved largely in Eastern European literature. Young religious students in particular were tortured, and often in ways that mocked or sought to commit great sacrilege against their Christian faith. Note that the sources below come from book accounts with titles like The Devil's Mill and The Hell of Pitesh. Readers beware. This is very sick stuff. The delirious imagination of Turkanu, the chief torturer at Pitesh, was unleashed above all when he was dealing with students who believed in God and who strove not to renounce their belief. Thus, some were baptized each morning, their heads plunged into a bucket of urine and fecal matter, while the others around chanted the ritual of baptism. This would last until the contents of the bucket started to bubble. When the recalcitrant prisoner was on the point of drowning, he would be pulled up, given a short respite in which to breathe, then submerged once more. In the so-called act of depersonalization, the students were forced under torture, permanent and unimaginable torture, to betray all they held dear. God, their own parents, brothers, sisters, and friends. They were constrained to drink urine, and to eat feces. The human being was thereby annihilated. Disgusted at his weakness, he would never be able to recover himself before his own conscience. The pain was beyond the power of human endurance. Then they undressed me. What followed is indescribable. Beatings on the head to induce stupefaction. Beatings in the face for disfigurement. Thousands of blows to the back, below the ribs, in the plexus, on the soles of the feet. Dozens of feints, and then all over again for hours on end, and the eye at the peephole always watching, always watching. They shattered my ribs, lungs, liver, kicking my bones, my kidneys with shod feet. When the victim was a theology student or a person with a certain religious feeling, he was made to genuflect to the bare bottom of one of the re-educated, to call that bottom an icon, and to kiss it. He would have to label the Holy Virgin the great whore, and Jesus Christ the great idiot crucified on the cross. If it was known that the victim loved his parents, Turkanu would provoke him thus, Tell me, X, how did you sleep with your mother? Or tell me how you caught your father raping your sister. The victim, after enduring the purgatory of re-education, was never abandoned, but was also drawn into the cast of executioners. Performances on religious subjects, black masses staged at Easter or Christmas, horrified the detainees. On such occasions, it was the theology students who were to suffer the most, dressed up as Christs, clothed in cassocks smeared with excrement. They were made to take communion with urine and feces, and instead of the cross, a phallus was fashioned of soap, which all others were made to kiss. Alongside them, hymns were sung with scabrous words, in which the commonplaces were insults against Christ and the Virgin Mary. Sometimes the detainees would be stripped naked. Sexual plays were also performed at the orders of Turkanu, naturally. On Good Friday he shared out the roles. The ass is fellated by Mary Magdalene. Joseph sodomizes the ass, which in its turn stands with its muzzle in the lap of the Virgin Mary, whore, concomitantly sodomized by Jesus. The re-educated, headed by Turkanu, displayed a diabolical pleasure in mocking the faithful, nicknamed mystics. Such scenes had a terrible effect on the victims, who as a rule found their only solace in faith. However, after participating in the black masses, 
their entire faith was shaken to its foundations. You were made to tug each other's genitals, or one of them would put his penis in your mouth. If you soiled yourself during beatings, you were made to eat your own feces and to lick the dirtied long johns, or to eat another's feces from your own mess tin, without being allowed to wash it after that. You were made to kiss each other's bottoms. You were made to urinate in each other's mouths. When you begged for water, you would be given urine from the bucket, or they would urinate in your mouth, or others would spit in your mouth. You were made to spit in each other's bottoms and then lick it up. They would wipe a stick smeared in feces on your mouth and in your mouth. You were made to stick your finger up your bottom and then suck it. With indescribable fury, they began to hit him with fists, cudgels, and feet, and to toss him from one to another until the bloodied wretch fell almost senseless and could no longer rise. After they had given him a few more kicks to the head, two of them picked him up and threw him on the bunk, making him sit with his hands in his pockets and his head bowed, according to the order. Then another followed, then another, as though in a devilish ring dance intended to annihilate the last speck of physical and moral resistance of those who entered into their rabid game. These descriptions speak for themselves. No macabre screenwriter or slasher film master would dare go this far. Betrayal of God was the order of the day, as was sacrilege in the name of Jesus, the great idiot crucified, and the blessed mother, the great whore. Holy days were special moments for obscenity and blasphemy, and there were black masses. Of course there were black masses. Who would say that the devil wasn't present there at Patesh?